please call. Um, so welcome everyone, I'm Amy Girdlestone, I'm the Secretary of the GA Tyne and Weir branch. Um, so just before we get started, a quick reminder that everybody's welcome to attend our events, whether you're a GA member or not. They're free, although donations are welcome, and we do encourage you to join the GA. We're keen to hear from you about topics that you would find useful in our lecture series, and you can see our contact details on the slide, so please get in touch with any ideas. Just a quick reminder to check out the GA's Geography Education Online, it's sort of abbreviated GAO website. It's very, very useful for those of you in years 12 and 13, especially if you're catching up on material missed during the lockdown. The materials and services are excellent quality and they are cheaper if you're a GA member. So just a few words about today and the chat function. So it's nice for speakers to have an audience rather than talking into the void of cyberspace. So if you feel comfortable doing so, please put your cameras on. I know from experience of teaching that it's always nice to be able to see everybody. Um, so if you have any <coughs> questions, you can pop these straight into the chat function and I'll compile them for a session at the end. And you can also use the raise hand function when you're invited to speak. Um, so please unmute your mic if you do so. Um, also, if you'd like a certificate for this talk, if you just pop your full name and email address into the chat, um, or you can email Louise, our vice chair, and her email address is just on the screen there. Um, I'll just give you a second if anybody wants to note that down, or if anyone wants to put their name and email address into the chat function. Okay, so today's speaker um, is Dr. Wen Ying Fu, who is a senior lecturer at the Department of Geography and Environmental Sciences at Northumbria University. Her areas of expertise, sorry, I've just um, knocked my slide. Sorry, Wen Ying. Um, so Wen Ying's areas of expertise include knowledge-based regional development, governance of knowledge transfer and regional entrepreneurship in transition economies. She single authored a book published by Springer titled Towards a Dynamic Regional Innovation System, Investigation into the Electronics Industry in the Pearl River Delta. And her research has been published in international peer reviewed journals, such as Research Policy, Journal of Economic Surveys, Journal of Technology, Transfer, Annals of Regional Science, and the German Journal of Economic Geography. So without further ado, I'll hand straight over to you, Wen Ying. Thank you. Can you see my share screen? Yeah. Yeah, okay. brilliant. Thank you for having me, um, Wen Fu. Uh, so thanks for the introduction, Amy. Uh, so today I'm going to present a speech titled as Regional Innovation Systems within a transitional uh, context. Previously, we had the topic as industrial uh, development, but I think it's just a um, different framing for different phases of economic development, especially in transition economies like China. I'm going to use a case study, a tale of two cities in, in China to illustrate um, the development stories um, in China. So a little bit about a research context. Uh, some of you might uh, already know that uh, the communist China or the so-called new China has been established in 1949, uh, but uh, it has experienced 30 years of uh, struggle and turbulence with um, the far left ideology since its uh, establishment. And um, from exactly 1978, since the 1980s, China started to embrace the neoliberal um, reform and opening policy. And um, to the left of this um, PPT, the slide you can see actually um, Mr. Deng Xiaoping, I will call him uh, the Chinese version of Margaret Thatcher because they, all were, uh, they were all politicians of the same period. And also they uh, have very similar um, political ideology, which is um, like the neoliberal reform, uh, market-prone um, uh, approach 
uh, although, of course, it has been situated within different political as well as um, national context. But um, I think for China um, at that time, it has reached a point whereby uh, reform was becoming very necessary at that time. Um, but unlike the shock therapy in Central and Eastern uh, Europe, in China, the planned economy as making the transition to a market economy uh, in a more what we call incremental and gradualist uh, approach, um, uh, slowly releasing uh, the growth uh, potential that was locked in by the old poorly incentivized um, planned economy system. But um, I think although it's a neoliberal reform and a market um, prone approach, the state always uh, played a very active role throughout the whole process as both regulator as well as um, facilitator. And innovation has been always um, been defined as a key drive for economic growth, according to the literature, according to, I think, the founding father of um, Jean-Peter in Germany. But for China in the previous, in the very beginning, catching up uh, phases, the innovation is more like um, incremental uh, manner, right? So uh, China, along with other developing countries like India, enjoys such uh, latecomer advantages that they can import those advanced technology from the uh, Western economies and um, um, upgrade their industries, um, et cetera, by learning, um, by doing, right? So, and that's also why you see numerous uh, small industry clusters appearing, popping up in the coastal uh, China because um, in this uh, dense uh, agglomeration economies, uh, firms can um, gather together and really um, learn from one another about how this um, technology, how this machine, how this uh, new product really works and make their incremental innovation based on that. Uh, mainly the product and process innovation. And China has been very famous, sometimes a little bit notorious for its carrot and stick uh, innovation policy. I think most of you have heard about, for example, the joint venture regulations. Once you enter into China, especially if you are like, like a large companies like Volkswagen, um, you are forced to join, um, like have a joint venture with the state-owned companies in China. So it actually tries to use, to leverage its large market potentials for access to advanced uh, technology. And its innovation policy became very proactive, especially since 2010s, led by, for example, initiatives of Belt and Road, um, which many of you might have already heard. And I would say this is characterized by a technocratic nationalism, which is um, in which you have very heavy nationalistic uh, efforts to boost indigenous uh, capabilities and uh, to, to promote your own standard uh, strategy, especially in those newly emerged industries like um, new electrical uh, vehicles, et cetera. And it has been led by a very clear political awareness to support uh, the national economic and security um, interest, which caused um, some of the controversies in the international uh, society. So the research um, or the stories that we are going to uh, begin our endeavor is the tale of two cities in the Southern China, which you see the circle here. So it's in the Southeast coast of China, which actually is very adjacent to Hong Kong. And um, if you, and these two cities are Shenzhen and Dongguan. Some of you might have already heard about uh, Shenzhen because it is called the new um, Silicon Valley in China, right? So almost half of the world's um, mobile phones are actually produced by uh, firms located here. Uh, Huawei, Zhongxing, or ZTE, and uh, Lenovo. So it has been become very competitive, not only because of its um, massive sales, but also um, because of its very um, heavy um, R&D inputs, as well as the um, 
patent filing activities all around the world, especially uh, Huawei. So Shenzhen is actually a very iconic city um, and it is always uh, deemed as the young and the most entrepreneurial city uh, in China, in the opening China. And if you just zoom in um, the locations, you will see uh, this is the Guangdong province and the orange part is the Pearl River Delta. And to the very south of that, it's actually Hong Kong. Um, so you can see the blank, the, the white blank uh, part here, that, that is Hong Kong. And you have uh, Shenzhen and Dongguan is a little bit to the north. So these two cities, uh, Dongguan and Shenzhen are very adjacent. While they share different development trajectories. So that's what fascinates me about this diverse economic geographies in China, right? So although it's very similar locations, they still have very different development um, stories and um, trajectories. And here I would like to point out the, the share of electronics cluster in these two cities. As you can see, the green part uh, represents the um, the share of the electronics industry and the size represents the industrial output. And you can see um, in terms of both output and share electronics clusters uh, takes a um, more prominent position and role in the Shenzhen economy, right? So it's more about a uh, high value added um, products because we all know that Dongguan is also called as the world factory for electronics um, production, but still its um, production value is um, nothing compared to that in Shenzhen. So if you look into the specific city development indicators, you can see, for example, um, the overall performance and pattern of specialization, especially in high tech uh, sector, um, in Shenzhen all outperforms that of Dongguan in terms of, for example, the share of uh, industrial output value of, uh, for the high-tech manufacturing sector, the share of uh, high-tech manufacturing and service sector in employment. So 33 versus 19%. Um, the R&D input um, and R&D personnel. And if you see the firm composition, you can all see a very clear divergence uh, here that Shenzhen actually has more uh, domestic firms, that means its economy is more endogenous. Uh, it has more capable firms than uh, that in Dongguan. So um, the observation all suggests that there are greater innovation, human capital resources, and firm capabilities in Shenzhen than that in Dongguan. And if you just look into the electronics industry, its trends, its temporary trends, you can also see that although they started at a very similar level in 1994, um, Shenzhen actually accelerated or growth grow, uh, exponentially, especially after the 2000s um, and ended up uh, with uh, five times more than uh, the output value of that in uh, Dongguan uh, just after the financial crisis. And um, previously I've done a more systematic um, firm survey in these two cities, collecting um, like questionnaire uh, for over 100 firms, electronics firms in each city. And I run this model uh, mainly to see what actually drives the innovation outcomes in these two cities. And I find that uh, innovation activities in Dongguan, if you see this Dongguan model and I highlight um, the, the key results. The innovation outcome in Dongguan are rather passively led by the globalized players such as the parent firms and the foreign companies, while Shenzhen firms have the strategy and capacity to really capitalize on wider sources of external um, uh, knowledge spillover. Okay, so you see actually a more interactive and diversified innovation system in the making in, in Shenzhen at that time. So the question that we have to ask after investigate, investigating this pattern is 
why these two cities have the different involving past and outcome in spite of a very similar starting point. As you can see, this is the historical map of these two cities. Previously, um, they all belong to what we call the Bao'an administration in uh, pre-reform China, right? Uh, even in 1970s, it all belonged to Bao'an uh, County. So uh, to the north is Dongguan, to the south is uh, Shenzhen. And actually in historical um, Asian China, or even in the Qing Dynasty, Hong Kong is also part of the Bao'an County. So Hong Kong, Dongguan, and um, Shenzhen, they all share very similar administrative um, um, histories because they have the same boundaries. Um, and if you look into the town archives of Bao'an from especially its Asian times, Shenzhen only became like the peripheral town adjacent to the British least um, Hong Kong after the Opium War or the first Opium War, right? And if you see these um, two maps, actually, or two graphs, this one is uh, in Shenzhen and this one is in Dongguan. And you see that um, it's actually a very town-based economy, which relies on maybe agriculture-related uh, economies like textile, you know, making from um, the cottons uh, planted there, and on a very small scale in the family workshops, etc. So this is the basic economic pattern in these two places before the reform um, uh, period in the 1980s. So one um, theoretical framework that we're trying to address this is the institutions and governance. Because I think when we try to compare those different stories, it's always good to have a coherent theoretical um, framework that can give us some insights about what really is the key um, you know, variables or factors underlying this process. So um, I use the key conceptual element in regional innovation uh, systems, which is actually the founding father what, what, of which- well, they've already started. Oh, what, did I miss the beginning? <laughs> so uh, the founding father of which is Philip Cook from University of Cardiff. And um, I think in the theory of regional innovation systems, the key con concepts is uh, the governance. So governance is defined as the institutions, namely the rules of the game, right? And also the organizations, namely the players of the game that jointly shape the incentives for economic actions. And um, the role of governance is that it can provide not only access to information, and also ensure credibility, thus reducing the transaction cost. But it can also, in a complex innovation patterns, like nowadays we have very complex products, innovation requires very, um, a lot of collaboration from many different actors. So governance, good governance can also coordinate collective actions and even create a learning atmosphere. So this is what the school of uh, RIS has uh, been trying to establish to really facilitate the establishment of, for example, uh, regional development um, in Europe, in EU. And in theory, uh, governance should, or it will also co-involve um, with the business system and adjust the focus of this institutional support to the newly emerging uh, innovation niche areas or activities. And this is actually the typology of regional innovation systems that I got from the book from uh, Philip Cook, Regional Innovation Systems, um, Globalized Governance in a Globalized Era. If you are interested, you can have a look in that book. And in page 23, there is, um, I think this very nicely presented um, typology of the RS. And to the, in the vertical um, dimension, you have the different types of business innovation. Um, for example, you have highly localized uh, type of innovation, which is uh, almost um, locally organized. You have also uh, very globalized innovation systems, which is dominated by the multinational corporations. 
and which the local SMEs are highly dependent on the MEs. Um, but here I would like to emphasize the different, this uh, horizontal dimension of, uh, for the governance of enterprise innovation support. And here we have um, to the two ends of the spectrum, we have the grassroots and the register uh, system. So in the grassroots uh, RIS, initiation process of, for example, technology transfer or innovation is locally organized. And it's more likely to be applied at near market uh, research uh, competence. Example of which would be, for example, industrial um, district system of Northern uh, Italy. And for example, the business innovation in Tuscany is highly localized without uh, policy support from the Tuscan uh, regional government. And also you have maybe the Californian high technology complexes of Silicon Valley, right? Uh, which are also grassroots in its organization of innovation uh, systems. But of course it's market orientation and product networks is much more globalized than the Tuscan uh, small cluster economy in that case. And to the other end of the spectrum, you have the register, RIS. So the governance of which uh, will, including funding, are led from outside, especially from the central government. So the typical um, example of which would be, for example, the Midi Pyrenees uh, in France, in which you have a lot of um, devolved national agencies dominate the local research and innovation landscape. And you have a very visible presence, uh, presence of large firm, often um, very um, nationally renowned firms um, in France in that kind of um, um, areas. And something in, the, uh, in, the, in between is the network um, uh, governance or the network uh, RIS, whereby the technology development is multi-level. So stylized um, story would be the button uh, Württemberg um, from uh, Germany. So you have the super local cooperation policy coordination between what we call different uh, land uh, governments. Okay. So if you apply this uh, typology to the Chinese context, uh, we can see that since the opening policy in the late 1970s, the Chinese central government has actually either been directly involved in economic development, such as you know, establishing the special economic zones, or has implicitly um, encouraged the bottom up, the grassroots approach, mainly by allowing more economic development autonomy to those local authorities. So um, mainly you have the bottom up, the grassroots one, and the top down, the register. Uh, model in the Chinese uh, context. So in the grassroots uh, system, the degree of super local uh, coordination is quite low because it has been organized at the very grassroots level of authorities like the township and village. And the funding comprises a mix of, you know, capital funds, um, grants and loans, uh, mainly from the local banks, local government and possibly the local chamber of commerce. On the other hand, in the deregister uh, system, the initiation of industrialization is primarily a product of central government policies. So leading to a high degree of coordination. And also the funding um, of which um, is largely um, centrally uh, determined, although the agencies may have decentralized you know, headquarters, regional offices, in different um, areas. And because it's a very centralized uh, system in China, so uh, these uh, key actors in the national innovation systems, they, they grasp those very scarce uh, knowledge related and knowledge intensive infrastructure um, within China. So this is a table that I uh, try to analyze, um, like what is the governance contents for different types of systems. Because if we have 
a simple production system uh, involving or upgrading to an innovation system, innovation oriented system, what should be the different governance contents in this sense? So I divide that into three dimensions. The first is the institutional competence. So in the production system, you just um, you are required to have just the capacity to design and execute industrial development policies. But in innovation our systems, you have to also have the institutional capacity to organize technology transfer and SNT uh, programs. In terms of supported infrastructure, it's not just about hard infrastructure. It's also about uh, how to establish um, certain density and quality of infrastructures for innovations such as uh, uh, universities, research institutes, um, and those training um, and skill development agencies, etc. And in terms of funding budget, uh, it's not just about your fiscal capacity to impose taxes and decide for your own public spending. It's also about um, control or shared execution of part of the strategic infrastructure and access to the capital market, which is not universal for all of the localities in China because um, this reform process, as I will illustrate later, reform process in China is always geographically and institutionally selective. And also you have to have a very high level of financial intermediaries um, in the localities. So if I put that into a diagram, I, I have this um, diagram that I try to understand how um, the localities may be positioned in a specific places in this grid, uh, in the production system, how they might evolve into different types of innovation systems um, in the future if they face upgrading uh, pressures. And for our case of Shenzhen and um, Dongguan, actually I positioned them uh, in these different places. And as you can see in uh, initial industrialization process in the production systems, right? We see that Shenzhen um, is, so we have Shenzhen here, um, uh, especially in the special economic zones. So the governance supporting industrialization is rather the register top down, and it is characterized by a, a state oriented involvement of economic development with very active strategic policy support. While in Dongguan, however, the governance that supports industrialization is grassroots, characterized by flexible organizations um, or institutions organized mainly by the township and uh, village authorities that are favorable for uh, overseas uh, investors based on very informal guanxi uh, networks. And I think the questions would be um, how its initial governance and the evolution logics actually affect the development of regional um, innovation systems in the, later, in the later phase. So that's why we have to also think about um, theoretically about involving logics of uh, governance, especially the top down and, um, and the bottom up that I have defined here. So I think um, we can consider these um, issues from two phases. So in the initiation process of industrialization, you actually, uh, the original players in the game has been defined already, right? So. Um, you have the, the original players actually define the capacity of the specific localities to process, absorb and adapt the external knowledge, um, the imported technology from outside at very early stage. And the top down approach outperforms those bottom up approach in a Chinese context because those more advanced knowledge or at least absorptive capacity, the human capital are highly concentrated within uh, the national innovation systems. So for example, the state level research institutes, um, et cetera, and those very large uh, state owned firms, not those locally based firms or uh, research, research bodies. 
And in the process of development, also you have this um, different approach. And uh, I would like to mainly discuss, for example, the pros and cons of the deregister or the top-down governance. Because, for example, the first aspect, the pros of the deregister governance in the process of development is that it has a higher degree of policy coordination. Uh, so it will focus on selected long-term trajectories and trying to develop um, a level of consensus on desirable futures for the localities. The second aspect is why um, framed as the first mover um, advantage because um, the deregist approach, which is mostly initiated and governed by the national level agencies with more power, is that especially institutional power, is well positioned to act as the vanguard of re reform and enjoy the privileges of the first mover advantage. But of course, you have the cons of um, the, the, uh, the register of governance. For example, there are likely to be decision-making mistakes and misinvestment in the selection of the key industries for policy priority, especially in situations whereby little information is collected from the market. And secondly, you will, uh, be, it will be uh, more likely to have um, soft budget constraints um, and especially in state-owned you know, um, corporations and it will lead to lower efficiency and poorer uh, performance than in the private sector. So in theory, those um, the register governance should um, gradually involved to a network governance involving the uh, initiatives from the local entrepreneurs and local um, organizations. And for the grassroots uh, governance in the process of development, it is more likely to encounter the situation because it will evolve gradually within the constraints of its previous um, institutions, while the top-down approach is able to start with blank shit or tear up the old inst in institutional um, setups. So for um, the grassroots governance, it will um, probably encounter two difficulties. The first is the competence trap. That means um, those um, initial players in the game, they possess limited capacity to absorb and um, new ideas they might encounter cognitive sun costs that impede new development dynamics and trajectories. And also, even if they can uh, envision this um, you know, future pattern, there might be also vested um, um, interest in those uh, grassroots organizations. So that might mitigate against um, any motivations for change uh, from above, um, for example. So uh, the grassroots uh, governance will have this lock-in uh, situation, which will create systematic market and policy uh, barriers to other development uh, alternatives. So coming back to the stories um, in these two cities, Shenzhen and Dongguan, I would like to um, uh, describe it from two phases, 1980s, the very initial phase of industrialization and the growth phase of industrialization in the 1990s. And in Shenzhen, um, actually the development has been started with um, compensation trade. Um, so compensation trade mainly with Hong Kong investors. But what is distinctive from other localities is the compensation trade has been targeted at a very high level by the national state at that time, because um, it's that the compensation trade, it, it, it actually it was targeted at those uh, electronics industry, electronics sector in Hong Kong, instead of the government industry, the toy industry in, in Hong Kong, which has also a lot of relocation activities to the Pearl River Delta at that time. But it has a very um, clear uh, technology or future visions for that. And the, the approach is also trying to um, uh, join, uh, have this joint forces from 
uh, between these large scale foreign investors, for example, the investment threshold of Hong Kong investors in the Shoko industrial zone uh, would be above certain you know, uh, threshold. And it will have the joint force with, with the large uh, state-owned um, state companies in China. And um, this will be able to actually introduce large scale production lines you know, building on the existing state on assets and the scale economy, scale economies of production. And also it aligns with the large state on um, uh, the large endowment of human capital from the state on companies. Because I think pre-reform, most of the graduates, if they perform well, they will be allocated. So the labor market is also plain, planned in China at that time. So it will be allocated to the state of firms, to the you know, national level uh, institutions, et cetera. So they also possess the human capital to actually um, enable them to absorb those um, imported te technology well. Um, and um, another approach is the transfer or the relocation of the national innovation systems. So basically at that time uh, in, early 1980s, uh, a lot of um, like uh, state level research institutes and large state art companies in every almost the 50 provinces in China, they all have their regional uh, offices or regional headquarters set up in, in, in China so that you can see maybe Jiangxi Mansion or Shanghai Mansion uh, everywhere in Shenzhen. So this is uh, actually through the, has been done through the regionalization process of the state-owned um, agencies and institutions out there. And these numerous uh, state-owned or national level agencies, they also form alliance between one another. For example, in 18, 1976 or 19, uh, sorry, 1986, there is um, a very large group called Shenzhen Electronics Group Company, which have joint forces from over 100 state-owned firms. And they establish an uh, electronics trade uh, market. And this trade market has become a very important breeding brand for entrepreneurship uh, for, for Shenzhen in the later phase. So uh, most of the entrepreneurs and firm owners I have interviewed there, they all have maybe at least over three years of working experiences or dealing experiences, transaction experiences in that um, electronics uh, trade market, whereby they learn the market, they learn the technology, they learn the products, and they just go to the uh, peripheral regions to set up the factories to exploit the market opportunities there. And in 1990s, I think um, Shenzhen encountered this need to upgrade from its standard consumer electronics like TV or radio to high-tech electronics. So the Shenzhen city government has identified um, uh, several preferred industries, especially they have set up a lot of uh, state level strategic projects for the integrated uh, circuit design, IC design, in, in Shenzhen, which gave rise to the development of Huawei, uh, Zhongxing, and uh, Lenovo in the later phase. And also, I think what's more important here is um, two things. The first is also the stock market reform. Uh, so the first stock market has been opened in Shenzhen in 1992, which actually offer the firms, especially the small firms, um, access to the capital markets. And also there is um, active privatization reform. For example, employee stock ownership was gradually um, allowed. So you see the entrepreneurs has been um, released from the old uh, national innovation systems. And also this graph that I show here shows the massive inflow of young migrants um, uh, often uh, skilled migrants um, to Shenzhen. So the presence of highly qualified migrants also contributed to the high level of entrepreneurial activities in Shenzhen, enabling the exploitation of market economies from, um, or market opportunities from the foreign technology. 
And uh, if we go a little bit north to another city, Dongguan, we'll see a very different um, development pattern there in the initial phase of industrialization in 1980s, uh, which I characterize as the grassroots governance. It also, likewise, it also started with the compensation trade, but the compensation trade there mainly focused in the 1980s, mainly focused on the garment industry. Why is that the case? Because without the national, without the central state support, explicit support, I mean, um, in the very beginning phase of industrialization, the capitalist, the the entrepreneurs, they're always afraid of political movements in the later phase. Maybe today, this year, you are allowed to open a factory. Maybe next year, you will be um, have a lot of like other tax and defined as anti-revolutionalist. Uh, so actually those investors, especially from Hong Kong, they bear a lot of investment um, risk so that you see the factory that they opened there is very different than the factory here in Shenzhen, very large scale factories and um, infrastructure, but they just use the village buildings um, on a very small scale to uh, hire um, maybe tens of um, female workers to do um, this, what we call compensation trade in government. So the Hong Kong investors will provide samples will provide um, um, the, the market channels as well as the materials and just to have to process that for, for getting the profits. And also because of that, uh, I think the, the graph here I show is a, a very, also a very important historical event that established the foundation of the social networks between Dongguan and Shenzhen. So that is the, the, the flee to Hong Kong um, movements, I think, from 1950s to 19, even the early 1980s. Um, so the Shenzhen River at that time was actually the Chinese version of Berlin Wall, whereby the people in the communist um, China trying to um, flee to the capitalist Hong Kong at that time um, because of various reasons. And for Dongguan, um, it mainly occurred in 1962, whereby you have the Great Famine at the time, and the people, the peasants, they have to, they have to survive, so they take the race to, to Hong Kong. And these people, these Dongguaners, they actually are a very important investment social ties um, after the reform. So after the reform, they just go back to their hometown village and trying to but because of the uncertain investment environment there, they go to their village uh, trying to have very flexible business you know, agreements with their village um, authorities. So that is why they have very small scale and scattered um, pattern of production in the very beginning phase of industrialization. Um, and coming to 1990s, you see that even without um, the higher level, like the provincial government uh, support, Hong Kong has, uh, Dongguan has also successfully attracted another round of overseas China, Chinese uh, from Taiwan to actually uh, invest um, in electronics industries, replacing its old industry, garment industry, um, thereby they have this upgrading um, industrial patterns or uh, structures. And also in this phase, you see the, the, the gradual, the slow gra um, evolution to the network governance because other than the village and township gov um, authorities, they now have initiatives from the city government, the Dongguan government, trying to establish this very high level, what they call Songshan Lake, industrial park trying to build high level, you know, uh, research institutes or, or high level uh, factories and some supported residential and commercial uh, infrastructures um, to attract those uh, global lead firms. But um, these initiatives have encountered um, resistance from below what we call vested interest, because in those uh, village economies, you have already a very um, solid um, interest or profit sharing schemes 
uh, there. So the, 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 the overseas investors, especially from Hong Kong um, and Taiwan, they share the profit with the township or the village authorities because they lease the land to them. And also the peasants, they get um, like um, income from the village uh, committee and also they get rents from the migrant workers. So actually the village um, and township um, authorities, they oppose to this, to this uh, reform um, very massively. And you also, uh, even some villages, they agree to uh, have the relocation. Uh, you have the competency trap um, in the face of upgrading, especially after 2000s, um, because as I mentioned before, uh, Dongguan lack those fundamental domestic mar uh, sector. So the domestic firms there is very, very um, negligible. And the local skill, uh, skill base is um, nothing compared to that in, in Shenzhen. So just to conclude, you can see um, the two cities actually involved into a very um, different patterns of um, the, the, the in innovation systems. Well, they all try to involve into the network governance, which would be the ideal governance because you have, you know, multi-level decision making process, but in Dongguan, it encountered more uh, resistance and ended up with a more uh, externally dependent economies. While in Shenzhen, it's more endogenous. You have also active uh, role of the domestic firms, you know, large infra influential domestic firms like Huawei and Lenovo, you know, playing part in interacting with the foreign companies there and leading to more innovation um, uh, opportunities. So just uh, to conclude, I think um, Shenzhen and Dongguan share very share many commonalities in the industrializing uh, process. So these two cities were both very underdeveloped uh, regions with very weak industrial base before the opening policy, right? And the initial industrialization in both cities also heavily depended on the combination, uh, combination of foreign investment, the compensation trade, and the ready supply of low wage migrant workers. Nevertheless, there are like two um, underlying and fundamental differences between the two cities. The first difference is the, of course, very obvious, uh, we are geographers, is the locational advantage of Shenzhen being geographically closer to Hong Kong than Dongguan. That is also why the central state selected Shenzhen as the um, opening uh, special economic zone in the first place. And yet the differences in location cannot account for the major differences in the long run trajectories of these two cities, because although Shenzhen is more adjacent, there is not like a um, very large um, distance from Hong Kong to Dongguan. More importantly, it would appear are the institutional advantage of Shenzhen over Dongguan. So Shenzhen's um, position in the vanguard of China's market oriented reforms gave it a first mover advantage in developing like new innovation supported institutions, which build on the existing national industrial structure and national innovation systems. And these changes appear to have facilitated the further establishment and incubation of new uh, local startup firms and also the efficient adaptation of existing firms to the diversified new markets. Okay, so it actually has a more virtuous development cycle reflective of a strong regional innovation systems. But in contrast, in, um, in Dongguan, they have a more grassroots institutional setup, which was focused on developing the compensation trade around lower end processing and assess assembly activities, which of course has its logics, as I explained, this very small uh, scale production because of the investment risk. Um, and you see the monetary gains are mainly uh, shared between the village and township uh, governments, the small sized uh, overseas uh, investors, mainly from Hong Kong and the local uh, peasants, all of which are reflected, uh, reflective of a much weaker RLS 
But um, when we interpret the advantage of the top-down approach, of course, we have to be always careful to, to the specific context, especially in China, as I said, the development is always defined, sanctioned, and governed by the central state. Uh, and this actually leads to the institutional advantage of Shenzhen over, over Dongguan in that, in that case. So if you think about it beyond the case of China, um, for example, in many literature in um, like Western regional economies, you also have a lot of like bottom up uh, regions, for example, those peripheral towns and regions in Northern Europe, um, they are also quite, they have very strong local innovation systems because they have quite a long history a solid industrial base, whereby in the case of Dongguan, they don't have that, right? So in those peripheral towns, they either have a very long established, um, you know, industrial base, mainly related to um, agriculture, like agriculture related mechanical industry, um, biotechnology, or even like a presence of um, a, a university or of, of, of of a more like applied um, nature, right? And so I think that's why um, in the Chinese context, development within the disposal of less competent uh, local authorities in the context of uh, transition economies lead to a less optimal uh, results. And in the case of top-down approach, um, as I said, because the development is always sanctioned and uh, governed by the central state. But of course, it has to be sustained by this vital market mechanism, which is geographically and institutionally selective by the state. Not every um, localities in China enjoy the freedom of market uh, reforms. Um, and this has actually released a lot of potentials and entrepreneurial vitality to the, to the city. So the final words I would like to draw here is advantage of the top-down approach over the bottom-up one is contextual, contextualized in the transitional economy, especially in the Chinese context, whereby it's highly centralized. And it's the, the mechanisms of which is constantly strengthened by this power dependency of knowledge base and vital and constant uh, market economy uh, reform because China has this gradualist approach or, of reform instead of the, the shock therapy. And uh, last note would be some policy implications because I think maybe your impression um, from this speech uh, would be grassroots approach doesn't work in China, but I, I, I would not draw such conclusions because Grassroots governance in China has been more widely applied because the central state, they have very limited resources. And um, it has been proven to be very cost efficient for the central government and has efficiently mobilized the resources and networks from the local level to develop um, the overall economy in China, especially in the coastal regions. You see a lot of grassroots towns, uh, towns and specialized towns uh, yet, while the grassroots governance has been argued to be an important means of mobilizing and promoting local resources and um, networks, I would suggest two lessons to be learned from those um, industrial clusters that, uh, firstly, they have to always um, be careful about, you know, monitoring um, or uh, implementing strategic plan of industrial development to grasp new chances of development, trying to unfasten the vested uh, interests uh, in those grassroots um, organizations. And also uh, more importantly, to, to enhance the human capital and also uh, the domest domestic firm uh, capabilities or capacity within uh, the specific uh, localities. Okay. So I think that's all for uh, my res uh, my, my speech. And if you would like to see more detailed um, analysis, you can always refer to my paper published in Journal of Economic Surveys, uh, together with Javier Kavila Dietz and Daniel Schiller from Hanover. That's where I got my PhD uh, degree. And thank you for your attention.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Wen Ying. That was really interesting. Um, we have three questions in the chat and they're quite long and wordy. So I'm going to try and invite the three speak the three askers to um, ask their questions. So Godfrey, do you want to go first and unmute your mic? Thank you very much, uh, Wen Ying, for your lecture, which I enjoyed very much. But I was thinking really rather um, at an angle to what you were talking about. And um, this is an economic policy of developing the Pearl River Delta. I was wondering whether in your view, it is also a political decision. So as gradually Hong Kong can be absorbed within the China system as we now seeing happening. And was it all one step towards something much bigger? Because it seems that uh, in China, it's a fairly unusual kind of thing to give the economic freedoms as we would see them uh, for that area. Yeah, thank you for your question, Godfrey. I think, yes, uh, when we talk about economic development issues in China, it's always heavily entwined with political decisions and political forces. So I would say um, the development of Pearl River Delta is very much dependent on Hong Kong. And even until today, I think I checked the national statistics last year when we had um, this big protest and movement in Hong Kong and still the China's trade and economy, uh, I think one third of the, one half of the uh, imports are still from, so flow to mainland China from Hong Kong and um, almost also one half of the FDI is also coming from Hong Kong. So of course that's not like firms from Hong Kong, but maybe German firms, they would like to invest in China. They go to Hong Kong to register a company because of better law protection there and then come to the mainland China. So Hong Kong is still playing a very important role uh, because of its better law protection and institutional environment. And yeah, I just feel very pity for the current situations. I don't know the way forward for Peru River Delta, but of course now the central state has this intention to build Shenzhen as the next Hong Kong. Uh, but I, I have very suspicious attitudes about that. Um, for the future because of the institutions are not complete there. And it's always, um, as I said, selectively given to um, localities and depending on the political ties maybe with uh, between the local um, officials and the central state. But at that time, I think Shenzhen uh, developed because of the need of China to really, it has reached a point whereby the neoliberal reform has become very necessary at that time. Because after the turbulence um, of great famine and also the uh, leap forward movement and also the cultural revolution, I think the economy of China has been wrecked to such a status that it needs some reform and market uh, Mecha mechanisms to really uh, bring up the life quality of the Chinese people. Thank you. Okay, I hope that answers your question, Godfrey. Um, Stephen, are you available to ask your question? Sure. Does China have a centralized strategy policy yet for adapting infrastructure and industrial zones to sea level rise over the next 100 to 1000 years? The West does not. We are likely to have a one metre sea level rise in 100 years and 10 metres to 30 metres in 1,000 years and up to 67 metres to 250 metres in 10,000 years. We cannot stop climate change, even though we think we can. All ports and shipping docks will need to be moved within 200 years. Yes, uh, thank you for your question, Stephen. I'm not a climate change expert, uh, but I... Um, as far as I, I know that China has made some promises to cut down the carbon dioxide emission um, by the Paris Agreement. Um, I don't remember the exact uh, share, but I think it's a massive cut that they promise. 
um, I don't know whether there is any centralized policy to really cope with the sea level rise in China. Nothing that I really heard from my side, but I know that China has devoted a lot of resources um, to develop, for example, the new energy sector, like uh, the new electrical uh, vehicle um, sectors, a lot of um, like um, subsidies and also state-owned companies um, joining, having joint forces with especially European firms. I think that is one of the key sectors of cooperation by the Sino-European uh, investment uh, deal just um, drafted um, in the beginning of this year. Um, so yeah, I think with the centralized efforts to really, because the new energy sector really has a lot of investment risks, and China has this institutional uh, advantage, at least in this regard, to really um, have the joint forces to invest in this highly risky um, areas. And also China has another advantage of a very uh, complete uh, manufacturing and supply chains. So once it would like to establish uh, like the electrical vehicles, the battery uh, production and all of other like new components, can be uh, applied to a large scale, leading to the scale economies, uh, reducing the cost, because I think the costs are the key factors for the new energy um, um, sectors. So in that sense, maybe China has some role to play in this uh, global combat uh, towards uh, climate change. Thank you. But the issue is that the globalized idea that we can stop climate change is wrong. So reducing emissions, even if all CO2 emissions stopped today, it would take 300 years to make any difference. And that is too late. And we're not going to stop CO2 emissions completely. So therefore they're going to keep rising for at least a thousand years, whatever we do. So therefore now is the time to start thinking ahead for what to do. For individuals, it is now, now is the time to move away if you live next to the sea before, like in Florida, house prices are already dropping mm -hmm. with storm surges. And a one meter sea level rise puts out of action half of the world's ports and docks and a two meter sea level rise puts them all out of action. And if that happened suddenly, then we'd be stuck. In the past, when we came out of the last ice age, the fastest rate of sea level rise was 30 meters in a hundred years per hundred years, but sometimes it stopped rising for a thousand years and sometimes it surged. And so we are not likely to have a surge yet, but maybe in 200 years, we could have a surge. Mm -hmm. And if we are not prepared, the entire global industry will stop. <laughs> yeah. um, also, nice China, has a lot of China has a lot of cities at four meters altitude. Um, yeah. I really have a very limited knowledge yeah. uh, of that, I, yeah. I should admit. Yeah, but I know that one thing is China trying to, for example, use this, use its, uh, you know, promise about cutting the CO2 emissions as a ge geopolitical uh, yeah. tools, for example, for those uh, like Pacific uh, Island uh, states, right, yeah. uh, near Australia. I think it's also um, a very, it's not just a um, natural science thing. It's also become, uh, I think climate change has become very geopolitical and political. And we have to always uh, pay attention to this kind of geopolitical intentions agenda mm -hmm. behind the promise. That's mm -hmm. what I have to say. But if, if, I, uh, if I owned an electronics factory in Shenzhen, I would think about moving. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Nothing anyway. I heard about from the factory owners about moving. No. Maybe I should tell them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you, Panther. And um, I think we've just got time for Alan's question. Alan, do you want to ask? Uh, can you excuse me? I just turned on the light. Sorry. Another way to come back. Yes. Um, uh, hello everyone, thanks very much. Uh, um, so uh, I'm not a geographer, I'm a development economist. Um, I, I'm, and I'm not an expert on China, I'm afraid, So, but I've uh, done some work in the past on uh, industrial development in Africa. 
Um, there's a research center in Oxford called the Center for the Study of African Economies that some people may be familiar with that did a lot of work um, using industrial survey data from across Africa many a few years ago that I was involved in. So um, I suppose there's two questions. Well, one was a point and a bit of a question. Um, I, I may have missed in some of the sort of figures that you were presenting at the beginning, whether um, the degree to which firms that have located in Shenzhen and the other location are oriented towards exports of their products or exporting their, their final products and whether that has any um, uh, role to play in the sort of the different um, levels of development that you've seen in those two areas or anyway, sorry if I missed that. And then my second um, question was just really about whether there are lessons that could be learned from the experience of um, southern China, Shenzhen and other, other uh, special zones in that area, particularly, I mean, obviously in other parts of the world, but particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, where there have been attempts in the past to establish special economic zones or export processing zones or, or sort of other uh, variants of those sort of things, but where you, you clearly have a, um, issues to do. I mean, if, if, if institutions and governance are key to the success of these sorts of ventures, um, you know, there are obviously questions about the, 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 the quality of institutions and governance in, in, in some of the countries that have, have attempted to implement these things. So I'd just be interested to hear your views on that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for the question, Alan. So the first question, is it about this the statistics or city indicators that you mentioned uh, that you might miss in the beginning? Yeah, I, I, I just, I'd just be interested to know whether you had looked at sort of for the levels of production of firms in these in the sectors you've been looking at in these two locations, whether you looked at the degree to which these are firms that are producing for the domestic market, okay, yeah. for the Chinese market, or for international markets, just because there's a lot of, um, as I'm sure you're aware, there's a lot of research mm -hmm. that tells you that yeah. export-oriented manufacturing firms tend to have to, because of the high levels of competition, they have to invest in uh, high level, well, they have high levels of human capital, they're more innovative, and consequently tend to be more productive. Yeah, I, I think for the case of Shenzhen and Dongguan, they are all very um, export oriented. I actually have another like paper in the making that I try to compare uh, Dongguan and Foshan. So Foshan is in the Western Bank of Pearl River Delta. That is more domestic uh, oriented. So it has very strong domestic brands for the fans, um, air conditioner, etc. cetera. Um, so I think domestic market is of, is of course a very important uh, like source of profit, especially after the financial crisis, uh, whereby you have a market shock in the Western economies. Um, but I think here is also another issue of institutional lock-ins, because as I mentioned in the development stories of Shenzhen and Dongguan, they actually have this form of compensation trade. And compensation trade is very much an institutional setups because it means those uh, companies, they are not formally registered. They are a very small scale um, operations, but um, it's the, the entry threshold of compensation trade companies is very low, right? And, but you can't actually, you don't have the license to sell in domestic market for those compensation trade corporations. And that's why uh, many uh, like firms and factories in Dongguan encountered a lot of lock-in uh, after the financial crisis when they would like to transfer or transition to the domestic market because of this institutional barriers so that they have to register in other companies. They can't use the original compensation trade um, you know, factories to do the same business, selling this product um, originally to, to the UK, now to uh, China. So I think there are like institutional barriers there because the Chinese government say, um, if you set up this compensation trade corporations, okay, I will give you tax return, export tax return, right? So that means you can't really sell this 
products to domestic market or else you can't get those uh, tax return. So this is a very rigid, uh, I think, uh, firm registration uh, uh, institutions at that time, which um, gives these obstacles uh, for transition to the domestic market. Well, um, in the Western Bank of Peru River Delta in Foshan, because they have a very strong legacy of planned economy. So the economy there has been always sponsored by the local banks and the local commerce or, or the township government there. So they have, a, have this kind of tradition of doing business with domestic market um, um, in that case. And also the second question about um, special economic zones um, now spreading up in Africa, I think also in India, right? So India would like to also follow the institutional, um, they call it examples of China, thinking it might be a more efficient way. But I think um, always as geographers, we view things um, within context. I think the success of China at that time also depends a lot on its context at that time, um, 1978. We have the end of Cold War, and Nixon also viewed China as the very important geopolitical partners to actually have this, um, you know, um, force against Russia at that time. So that's why we have this very uh, precious his historical moment to actually embrace foreign direct um, investment. And but now in Africa, the the context, the temporal context, I, I think, kind of change. Um, and you see that the import of such institutional frameworks from China to Africa actually encountered a lot of um, uh, issues such as corruption and also um, political dependence of African states on China. Um, and, and the power imbalance in this process is very uh, prominent. And, I really can't say sure about um, the success or the failure of African special economic zones, and I don't know. I don't have very in-depth research there, so that's just my first impression um, about um, its future. Thank, thanks very much. I mean, the interesting thing is that uh, its current government policy, I think, to establish some of these zones here in the UK. So uh, that will be interesting to see whether we can manage to learn the lessons. Yeah, maybe, especially in the Northeast. <laughs> hey, thank you very much, Alan. And thank you, Wenying, for that really good talk and for answering the questions there. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for having me. So, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, and many thanks for Wenying. Um, so please sort of don't forget to get in touch for your certificate of attendance for a day session so as said before you can either pop that information in the chat or you can email louise um so our next event is on monday the 22nd of february when we'll be learning about the regeneration of newcastle and gateshead keys um, and you can sign up using the details on your screen or on social media so we're on instagram facebook and twitter and we'll see you again soon <laughs>